Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Rifleman. It has been a while. I am aware of that, and I know that some of you are aware of it as well because I have received some questions and comments. Uh, but please, rest assured, I am right now diligently working on producing uh, a bunch of gun videos. Some will include shooting, some won't. Uh, but there's going to be at least one per week dropping over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, and in addition to some new gun videos, uh, I was recently taking a look at my collection of knives uh, that are uh, of military origin or formerly military uh, knives and some pseudo-military knives. And I want to do a video where I'm going to take a look at my general military knife collection. But today, uh, much more specifically, I want to take a look at a series of bayonets that was used by the United States military um, starting in World War II and continuing through to today, actually. Um, as many of you probably already know, we entered World War II with the exactly one bayonet, and that was the Model 1905 which was already a very old soldier at the time that the, uh, the beginning of World War II. It was over 10 years old, I think, when we entered into World War I. And um, it, it had a 13-inch blade. It was even longer than this one. And within a couple of years of entering into World War II, um, we modified the M1905 to become the M1 bayonet. And uh, this is basically um, a 1905 uh, with the bayonet shortened three inches to make it uh, a 10 inch blade. Um, this one's actually not been shortened. This is a, uh, a production M1 bayonet, but a lot of older 1905 bayonets were converted into the M1 configuration. But the thing about the M1 is um, it is a wonderful uh, bayonet. It's a wonderful combat knife. It's a beautiful high quality object. Um, but it's made from really massive uh, steel forgings. It requires a lot of machine time. It's an expensive thing to manufacture. And most of all, it's quite heavy. Um, the entire grip area and the pommel and uh, the blade itself are all one steel forging. And um, I don't actually have, I haven't put this one on a scale, but rest assured, it's uh, quite a heavy item and slow to manufacture. And we needed something more modern. And uh, starting in 1943, I believe, uh, we started adopting a series of, first a knife and then a whole series of bayonets to equip a series of different rifles that we went through. And they're all based on the exact same blade design. And I have a representative example of all of them except one. Uh, laid out on a table over here, and I just thought it'd be interesting to take a look at them and take a look at the evolution of the M4 through M7 bayonet. So let's go over and take a look at those right now. So as I already stated, um, about one year into World War II, uh, the Ordnance Department decided that the original Model 1905 bayonet was just too long, too cumbersome, um, and really too, just too obtrusive for modern combat. And they adopted the M1 bayonet, which is what you see here. They adopted this in 1943. And, um, and with it, the M7 scabbard. Uh, you can see this one has the ordnance flaming bomb on there and a, uh, some sort of cage number or part number on there. Uh, no M7 markings on this particular one. And this was made from fiberglass, uh, reinforced with uh, epoxy, presumably some sort of resin. You can see a little bit of it worn through there. Uh, this one has a rack number on it. And again, this was a fantastic heavy duty knife, uh, you know, fullered blade. It's beautifully ground, beautifully finished, but it was heavy and it was expensive. And it really, although it was an improvement over the Model 1905, it really um, wasn't uh, modern in uh, the fullest sense of the word and uh, quickly became apparent that they would eventually need to replace this bayonet in service.
But around the same time, the Ordnance Department started giving some thought uh, to possibly needing to produce another bayonet, um, this time for the M1 carbine. The M1 bayonet was for the M1 Garand rifle. Uh, the M1 carbine had been designed as a small personal defense weapon, meant to be very lightweight, and it had no provision for mounting a bayonet, and there was no bayonet to go with it at the beginning of the war, and it was never intended to be used as a sort of frontline infantry weapon. But as it turns out, it ended up getting used as a frontline infantry weapon, and uh, the military brass decided that they needed a bayonet for the M1 carbine. And it was that project that really set in, in motion uh, this evolution that would turn into a whole series of bayonets. And so they started thinking about designing and adopting an entirely new uh, bayonet design that would be much more suitable for the lightweight little carbine. And in addition to looking at, at completely new designs, they started looking around uh, for things that might be in uh, the military inventory already, uh, upon which this new bayonet could at least be based. And the thing that made the most sense was a combat knife that was adopted in 1943. This is the Camillus M3 trench knife. And uh, as I said, this was adopted in 1943. It was adopted as a sort of a commando knife. Um, one look at this and you will see uh, the, the resemblance to things like the Case V-42 Stiletto and the Sykes Fairbairn knife um, are pretty obvious. Uh, this is not at all like uh, other more traditional combat knives that the military had been using, uh, like for instance the Mark II. Uh, this is a modern reproduction made by Case. Uh, this knife had been adopted in 1942 and was much, much more similar um, to the sort of knives that, that uh, soldiers had been carrying in the field for a long time. But the new Mark III trench knife um, was a complete departure, and it immediately proved to be fantastically uh, popular with troops. Now, this is also a relatively modern reproduction um, I bought this, I don't know, in the late 1980s or the early 1990s. Um, it does have the ordnance bomb on it. Um, it does have, uh, I believe there's another ordnance bomb on here, no. Um, but it says USM3 Camillus here. Um, and this was a fantastically popular knife. It got very positive feedback. It proved to be an extremely effective weapon. Not the greatest field knife in the world. You would have been much better off um, cutting, uh, cutting up your potatoes and things with the uh, Mark II. Um, but the M3 was fantastically popular with troops, and it was relatively lightweight. And the Ordnance Department started thinking, perhaps we could use that as a basis for our new uh, bayonet. And so, in 1944, the Ordnance Department adopted its first bayonet for the M1 carbine in the form of the M4 uh, bayonet. Uh, they also developed a brand new uh, scabbard. This one is also resin impregnated, but it's uh, not made from fiberglass. It's made uh, from cotton fiber, and you can kind of see the texture of that uh, through the surface of the uh, bayonet. Um, but you can see the US M8 markings on there and it was just a plain uh, fiber and resin scabbard and you can immediately see from looking at the new M4 bayonet that it is really nothing more uh, than the Camillus M3 fighting knife uh, same stacked leather, leather handle identical blade uh, profile uh, it's simply instead of having this upswept uh, bit of guard on the back of the knife. They've replaced that with a ring that goes over the muzzle of the M1 carbine, and there is a catch incorporated into the pommel plate to go onto the bayonet lug on the carbine, the new bayonet lug that was incorporated into uh, new production carbines. Um, and 
turned this into a somewhat more effective um, small infantry rifle by being able to attach a bayonet. Now you can argue whether or not the addition of a bayonet on an M1 carbine makes a whole lot of sense, uh, but the military thought it did, and they found a pretty decent bayonet in the M3 trench knife and simply uh, adopted it as the M4 bayonet with a few minor changes. Later in the war, um, it became apparent that these stacked leather handles uh, were not the greatest things for fighting in the rain and other wet conditions. They had a tendency to rot and fall apart. Um, and uh, the military was still using stacked leather washer handles, but uh, they were kind of becoming sort of passe. And so um, later in the war or shortly after the war, I'm not sure on the date, um, the M4 bayonet was upgraded uh, with plastic, black plastic handles that were held in place with two screws. Um, other than that, it's virtually identical. Um, this one was made by Camillus, uh, same as the M3 trench knife. This particular example of the M4 was made by Imperial, uh, the parent company of Schrade. Not sure if you're going to be able to read that or not. Maybe I'll take a closer shot of that. Um, but the catch on the uh, pommel is exactly the same. The guard's exactly the same. The blade is exactly the same. They just did away with the leather uh, handle. And this is another version of the M8 scabbard. But this one, uh, I think, was made in Denmark. This is a European version. Uh, it was produced for... Uh, bayonets that were part of the Lend-Lease program. Denmark got a, a whole bunch of M1 uh, Garand rifles from the United States and presumably probably also M1 carbines. Um, and the interesting thing about these scabbards, uh, they're kind of outside the, the uh, scope of this video, but um, as you can see, it almost looks like wood. Um, and I originally thought that was some sort of uh, resin impregnated fiber that just ended up kind of looking like wood. But in fact, as it turns out, I believe this is a resin impregnated wood. Um, so it's it's quite stable, you know, it has that um, epoxy resin still inside it, but the reason it looks wood grained is because that actually is wood. And quite a few of these were returned uh, to the United States and sold off as surplus a few years ago. And um, so we got a few of those. And in fact, it wasn't until after World War II, and even after the Korean War, in 1954, the Ordnance Department finally replaced the M1 bayonets that were left in inventory, and many of those had been shortened again to 7 inches, I believe. Um, this is a 10-inch World War II version. Uh, but it was in 1954, uh, the Ordnance Department started looking for a new bayonet for the M1 Garand rifle, and it came in the form of the M5 bayonet. And if you look at that blade, you can clearly see it's uh, pretty much identical um, to the uh, M3 trench knife and the M4 bayonet. It's the exact same uh, knife profile. Um, this is actually an M5A1. Uh, the M5 was adopted in 1954, the M5A1 was adopted later in the 1950s and made up, I think, through the 1960s, maybe even into the 1970s. Uh, but you can see M5A1, and this was Milpar uh, manufactured. Milpar was a big provider of uh, bayonets and other things to the United States military. Um, the grip is significantly different than that on uh, the M4. It's a complete departure. You've got the latch um, for the bayonet lug up here in the front and it's you just squeeze it like a trigger and this pin here enters into the uh, recess on the front of the gas plug of the rifle uh, as the front uh, stabilization point. Um, this bayonet is a really great example of how soldiers use bayonets in warfare or 
in the field um, for everything except uh, bayoneting the enemy. I mean, this thing is so dull, it's unbelievable. Um, this thing has obviously been in the contact in contact with the soil quite a bit. May have been used uh, to aid in uh, breaking up dirt and digging foxholes. Might have been used to probe in the soil, uh, looking for landmines. Um, who knows? Uh, this one's definitely seen better days. The guard's a little loose. Um, but there again, it's essentially the M3 trench knife coming back once more. Now, there was a bayonet that came after the M5 and before the M7, and you guessed it, it was the M6. And that was adopted um, as a bayonet for the uh, new M14 rifle. Um, I think the M14 was adopted in 1957, assumably, uh, uh, I would assume, presumably, um, the M6 bayonet came along in 1957 as well. Uh, we've never had an M14 and we've never had an M6 bayonet. So we're gonna skip right over that. Uh, but the M6 bayonet does have a blade that's um, identical to all of these other bayonets and the M M3 trench knife, as you can see. So in 1964, um, long story, which I'm not gonna get into, the United States military adopts the M16 rifle as designed by Eugene Stoner and originally uh, manufactured by Armalite. Uh, Colt picks up the contract. Um, the AR-15 rifle, as it was originally known, becomes the M16, and the United States again finds itself in need of another new bayonet because none of these would work on the new M16 rifle. And they went back to the same well, dropped their bucket down, and came up with the m 7 bayonet. Um, oh, by the way, somewhere along the way, um, the M8 scabbard, like you'll see here with this early M4 uh, bayonet, turned into the M8A1 scabbard with the addition of a steel reinforcing cap and um, a ferrule for the leg tie down uh, on the end of the scabbard. So that was one change that was made um, and actually that's on this uh, M5 bayonet. I didn't uh, take the time to show it, but there's an M8A1. This is a Vietnam era one. Uh, Philadelphia Workhouse, PWH, uh, that was the Philadelphia Workhouse for the Blind. They were the number one supplier of M8A1 uh, bayonet uh, scabbards during uh, Vietnam. And this is an M7 bayonet and it was made by you can see here us m7 and you see boc that was for bauer ordnance corporation and they were the number one supplier of uh, m7 bayonets during the vietnam war and this is a fairly early um m7 bayonet you can see this back cut um uh, here where the uh, uh ricasso meets the uh, blade uh the grind of the blade, we have this very square back cut. Um, that's an indication of an early Vietnam era uh, bayonet. If I took the grip panels off, I'm not going to do that because it'll take too much time. I'm already pretty far into this video. You'll see some slots milled into the tang of the grip. And um, all of those are indications of an early M7. If you go back to the second generation M4, however, you can see um, the uh, design similarity between the old M4 and the newer M7. Um, the bayonet catches are very, very similar, and the only real difference on the guard is that the, uh, the hoop uh, that goes over the uh, flash suppressor on um, the M16 rifle is much larger in diameter uh, because the M1 carbine didn't have a flash hider, it just had uh, the muzzle of the barrel. So that's the biggest visual difference between the M4 and the M7. Otherwise, uh, they basically went back to the well and made the same identical um, bayonet again. So not a really uh, a difficult thing to develop and adopt. And it worked well enough here 
and it worked well enough here, and it worked well enough here and here, so they just went back to the same thing. Um, a little bit later, uh, towards the end of Vietnam, I think 1972 or so, there were some changes made uh, to the specifications for the M7. They did away with the cutouts in the tang uh, under the handle scales. And they also made a change to this back cut and turned it into a smooth arc. And what that does is it uh, relieves a major stress point here. Um, I don't exactly understand how that works. You could talk to a mechanical engineer and they could explain it better. But a 90 degree angle creates a stress point and under uh, extreme stress, you could have a bayonet blade break off. Um, I've never heard, all of these have 90 degree back cuts, uh, including the M3 trench knife. And I've never heard of any of those snapping off. Not to say it doesn't happen, not to say it's not even common. I've just never seen it. Uh, but apparently this is much stronger. And again, those cuts in the tang that were made to lighten the uh, bayonet were done away with because uh, they really didn't reduce the weight very much. Um, so that's the evolution of this style of bayonet. I don't know that there's a name for this family, but we'll say the M4 through M7 bayonets, which all are based on the same blade uh, from the M3 uh, trench knife. Now, um, this knife is still, and, and, and this, both of the M7s, uh, can still be found in U.S. inventories today, even though they were replaced ostensibly by the M9 bayonet uh, back in the 1980s or early 1990s. Uh, you'll still see M7s in uh, armories today. And actually, when this was adopted in 1964, and although we're still using it today, uh, this was already a pretty outdated um, design. As great as the M3 trench knife blade design is, and as wonderful um, a commando knife or fighting knife as it is, it's really um, pretty limited. And the use of uh, bayonets today is almost non-existent. And in fact, the Russians were actually a bit ahead of the curve uh, as early as the Vietnam War. I just threw this up here to show you. Um, that when we adopted this bayonet in 1964, which is basically just a, a spike to go on the end of your rifle or a, uh, a pig sticker um, to try to stab somebody who crawls into your foxhole in the middle of the night, the Russians had already adopted a uh, bayonet that was intended to be uh, more of a field tool. This is the uh, first ver uh, variation or the Type 1 AKM ba bayonet. It was adopted by the Russians in 1960. Um, and as you can see from looking at it, it's much more like a field knife um, than just a dagger. And never mind the fact that this blade is absolutely dull and doesn't do anything, but you could sharpen it up and have a pretty decent field knife. Um, there's a wire cutter, an integrated wire cutter built into the scabbard and uh, the bayonet blade, you hook them together like this and put wire in this cutout and you can snip right through um, uh, barbed wire or concertina wire. Um, you can even cut electrified wire as long as you're careful. You've got this rubber insulator and a leather frog and the handle, uh, the grip, uh, the bayonet is actually made out of phenolic resin and even has plugs over the screws or rivets to prevent the uh, conduction of electricity into your hand. So if you're very careful, you can even cut electrified wire with this setup. Um, you got a bit of a saw on the back of the blade. Not a very effective one, but uh, a saw nonetheless. And um, this just goes to show... now. The execution of this isn't quite as nice as most of the uh, U.S. military knives, uh, but the Russians were definitely thinking uh, a lot more progressively than our Ordnance Department was at the same time. Um, these were out in the early 1960s. This is actually a Romanian version, which was made, uh, I think, in the mid-1980s, but it's uh, physically identical to the first variation um, AKM bayonet. So that's about all I've got to say. Let's go wrap this up. 
So although the age of the bayonet was more or less on the decline by the beginning of World War II, um, the M4 through M7 bayonets, which are all, again, basically based on the same design, uh, have served now for 70 or 80 years and are still in service today in the, in the case of the M7. And uh, who knows, they may go on for another couple of decades. So it's a pretty interesting piece of equipment. It's one that oftentimes gets overlooked. And uh, I just thought it would be interesting to take a look at the evolution of those knives or bayonets. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna have some other videos coming out very soon. Another one including a bunch more military knives, particularly if I get a good reaction to this video and then there are going to be some gun videos coming up also very soon so when i post those i hope to see each of you here then later guys